In dangerous waters, on dirt tracks, across cold mountains, people are moving, looking for a better life. They're scared, hungry and desperate, but they also have hope. Hope about what lies on the other side of the path they're on. Hello and welcome to our TRT World Special on World Refugee Day. Mass migration is at its highest level in recorded history. In this programme, we're going to look at why people move, how host countries react to new arrivals, what refugees are running from and what they're going to. Their numbers are staggering, the challenge is immense and their stories thought-provoking. Some countries call it a crisis. Some differentiate between refugees escaping conflict and those who are only leaving for greater opportunities. They call them economic migrants, as if that dilutes the desire for a better life. Towards those who are seeking safety, does the world have a collective responsibility? The burdens on a host nation can be significant. The questions are many. How much will it cost? Will the new arrival fit in? Will they speak the language? How long before they get a job? Our first report is from Greece. The European Commission recently declared the migration emergency over, but on the Greek island of Samos, the situation is worse than ever. Mustafa Bashiri arrived here three months ago with hopes of a better life, but until now he has been living in a shelter he built himself and shares with five other men. I came from Turkey. I want to go to Europe, but I don't feel here is Europe because here is a lot of problem. We live in the tent, we don't have uh, shower, we don't have toilet, and here it's so dangerous. Mustafa is one of the 4,000 people who live at this camp near the town of Vathi. It was built to house only 700. The rest live in the surrounding bushland, the so-called jungle. They have to build their own shelters from whatever they can find. A steep ravine cuts across the jungle and people have to walk through it every day to go from one side to the other. It's filled with trash and infested with rats and snakes and poses a threat to their health. This is problem. This is problem. This is problem. Because it is jungle. It's not for living. Before two days, the mouse cut my hand. Aid workers say these conditions have taken their toll on the refugees' health. And with only one doctor currently working in the camp, contributions by NGOs are crucial. People often come to our clinic after being bitten by rats, snakes and insects. Hygiene outside the camp is unacceptable and very little water is provided. Another major issue, especially for women living in the jungle, is safety and privacy. When we came here, until now we can't go anywhere to uh, wash our body. It's not safe because when we go there, uh, the doors don't have lock. According to an agreement reached in 2016 by Turkey and the EU, refugees who make it to the Greek islands can't leave until their asylum claims are processed. And with an understaffed asylum service, this can take more than two years. It is a long time to live in tents and endure sleepless nights because of the pests, and they miss home. At night when I sleep, I, in my dream, my places come here, my friends come here. 
When I wake up, sometimes I'm crying. Still, the people in this camp dream of a new home, one with walls, a roof, and a firm foundation. Valentini Anagnostopoulou, TRT World, Vathi Samos. For migrants and refugees hoping to reach Europe, one of the most favored routes is across the Mediterranean. The number of low-level conflicts in Africa makes it a continent that more than most provides a reason for leaving. And there's the climate crisis. The scientific evidence is that in a little over a decade, life-threatening weather will become a regular occurrence. In the past 30 years, across just five African countries, almost 40,000 people have died because of water conflicts. In the desperation, there is light. Let's go now to Ethiopia, which is moving towards integrating refugees into the domestic workforce. Million Afawaki fled Eritrea four years ago to escape its indefinite military service. Back home, he worked as a systems administrator. But in Ethiopia, he volunteers to train fellow refugees in Addis Ababa. He is not paid, but he does get an allowance for transport. Here, I, I only teach the basics. It's not the pay grade that I'm supposed to do, but it's okay. Like, since I'm called to the refugee here, and then the police and everything here, like, we didn't get a work opportunity and the work permits. Afawaki is hoping a new law will allow refugees like him to take regular jobs and earn regular wages. The program has had a slow start, as the government says it is building awareness and recruits in both the public and private sectors. By this time, uh, we uh, uh, create a chance for 40 refugees to be hired in private company nowadays. This, this, done, this has been done within the last three months. The government plans an enormous expansion. Ethiopia has an open-door policy on refugees, and this new legislation is part of the country's $500 million program, which aims to create 100,000 jobs. Ethiopia has taken in nearly a million refugees. They come mainly from South Sudan, Sudan, Eritrea, and Somalia. In some areas like Ethiopia's border with South Sudan, refugees outnumber the local population. They live in camps and at the moment depend solely on aid from the UN Refugee Agency. The new law would set up farming and business projects to provide jobs, but 70% of them will go to Ethiopians. The success of this legislation will, determine, uh, will be determined to a large extent by the support that Ethiopia receives um, from our donors, from key stakeholders in, um, in, in this uh, joint um, uh, um, effort to address the needs of refugees. But Afawaki fears it won't be easy for refugees like him to find employment. If we are supposed to uh, work as a competitor, then I think it's going to be a little bit harsh for us. Uh, that's what I think. And then, I don't know, but uh, we will try. Afawaki plans to remain in Ethiopia because he fears being put in prison in Eritrea. Every day, he checks if any job openings for refugees have come up, because he also plans to start earning his own way. Koleto Anjohi, TRT World, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Well, let's speak to Evelyn Aero. She is the regional advisor for East Africa and Yemen with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, Evelyn, can we start with your take? How do you see the approach of European nations to what's happening in the Mediterranean? Uh, we see that uh, we see that the low-income countries are more generous with uh, displaced populations. We see countries like Turkey, uh, Pakistan, and Uganda being more generous and taking many more uh, displaced people, especially refugees. And we see that this is a huge burden, especially with more than 70 million people now displaced worldwide, and the highest number. Uh, uh, ever registered. And from East Africa and the Great Lakes region, five million of these are from this region particularly. So we need to see these Western governments also contribute to the principle of shared responsibility and begin to also open up their doors and take in more of these displaced people. If we look beyond the situation as it is today, how prepared do you think the world is for the effects of the climate crisis and the migration that that's going to produce? I think that uh, the world needs to do more. One of the things we have seen is that when these emergencies happen, we've seen that there is a lot of focus on life saving. And we need to make sure climate and environmental issues 
are also part of the early solution. At the onset of the emergency, what the, our assistance should be also tailored towards uh, promoting, uh, protecting the environment, and also taking into consideration the impact of those populations and that influx on climate change. What if the solution of host nations is eventually to completely close their borders? Where will that leave the world if in 10 or 20 years' time, and it is possible, no one knows what's going to happen, but it is possible that host nations will simply say, no, we are not going to take any more refugees or migrants. We're only going to take economic immigrants and we're going to vet them extremely heavily. Where will that leave the world? I think, uh, of course, we, are not, we, will, we cannot speak for where that will actually lead the world. But one thing we know that already with the, uh, the asylum space becoming smaller, we are seeing them adopting different coping mechanisms. We are seeing those that have tried to access asylum and are not being assisted to get their refugee status determined or get the proper documentation to, to enjoy their rights as refugees or displaced people. We are seeing them either returning to unsafe places and uh, spontaneously with their own means, or we are seeing them also choosing to be uh, illegal migrants as a coping mechanism. We are also seeing human traffickers taking advantage of these groups that are vulnerable and at risk and actually exploiting them. So we know that uh, if this space continues to get smaller, we know that the risks will increase and we will still have to address those risks. So the consequences will still come back to us. What would you do to save the lives of your family if soldiers came to your home and told you to leave? If you'd heard the stories of massacres in other towns, what wouldn't you do to save your family? It's why almost one million of Myanmar's Rohingya Muslims have fled to Bangladesh. Life in a refugee camp is not a good life, but it's a life, and the Rohingya have little choice for now. Bangladesh is a land and resource poor country, but it can't send the Rohingya home because there only slaughter awaits. The UN accuses Myanmar's army of genocide against the Rohingya and says it's not safe for them to return. In 2017, nearly a quarter of a million Rohingya in Myanmar fled a wave of attacks by Buddhist mobs and the army. The stateless population had their homes destroyed and thousands were killed. Two years later, the majority are living in overcrowded Kutupalong, the world's largest refugee camp. There's no modern infrastructure here. Disease spreads easily, and many children are malnourished. But what comes next for the Rohingya refugees? To clear land for the camp, thousands of trees have been cut down. And that means the area is more at risk of flooding when the monsoon rains arrive. There's a plan to move the refugees to an island hours away, but it's also prone to flooding and cyclones. Some Rohingya are losing hope that things will get better in Myanmar or in Bangladesh, and they're risking dangerous sea journeys to flee elsewhere. Is there any hope that the refugees will be able to go back home? <laughs> Bangladesh and Myanmar are trying to come up with a deal that would see Rohingya refugees repatriated to their home country. But Rohingya in Myanmar are being held in camps where they have few rights. The oppression they fled hasn't ended, and so most Rohingya would rather remain refugees. Abu Bakr al-Shamahi, TRT World. The way the President of the United States describes Central American migrants has legitimized hate. Crimes based on religion and race have risen every year in the US since Donald Trump was elected. It hasn't stopped them from coming. Government figures show the number of people arrested in May while trying to cross the Mexican border into the US was the highest it's been in a decade. The countries that surround Mexico, though, they're not the only Latin American nations that are producing displacement. Since 2015, four million Venezuelans have fled a growing political and economic crisis. It makes Venezuelans one of the most displaced populations in the world. Back north in the White House, Trump has tried more than once to impose travel bans on Muslim-majority countries. The growing number of populist world leaders is affecting international solidarity. Their language makes it easier for them to reject any moral contract with migrants 
while they fence their countries in with walls, barriers, and barbed wire. Pastor Gustavo Banda is on a mission to help refugees coming to Mexico any way he can so that they can pursue a better life in the United States. In this moment, uh, we make our church uh, be become a shelter in this moment. We have in this moment 350 refugees from all over the world, principal, from Venezuela, from MIT, uh, from Chile, and from all over Central America. Even though Pastor Gustavo hosts refugees from all over the world, he's noticed a common thread among all of them. The people from IT, from Venezuela, from Brazil, from Chile, is the same story. They say there are nothing in their countries in, the, in this moment, and their dream is to go to, to, the, to the USA. Nora Morales recently arrived to Pastor Gustavo's shelter from Chiapas, Mexico, with her husband, who comes from Guatemala. Nora is quite familiar about the hardships her family had to face just to get here. Here in Mexico, we're looking for all kinds of jobs because we have to make enough money to save to get across the border. And we don't get any help from family or anything. Nora and her family have made their temporary home in the city of Tijuana. For many refugees, Tijuana is the last stop on their trip before crossing into the U.S. As a result, the influx of migrants has left quite an impact on the city. The latest declaration from Trump is that if Mexico continues to keep the border open to let immigrants in, then the Mexican economy will suffer. So now there aren't a lot of immigrants coming to Mexico. We know it's because the federal government is working hard at the southern border to keep the immigrants out, which is why there's not as many in Tijuana right now. Meanwhile, on the federal level, Mexican officials are still working out how to deal with the flow of migrants into the country, as U.S. President Donald Trump continues to threaten to close the U.S.-Mexico border. As for Nora, all she's hoping for is an opportunity to provide for her family and to ensure her children have a better future. We would be very grateful if they could give us asylum, especially with all that's happening and all we're going through and all the people who are needy that are dealing with crime and violence. Although Mexico has agreed to reduce the number of migrants traveling through the country to the U.S., no official deal has been reached. In a bid to avoid U.S. tariffs, the Mexican government is trying to show that it's taking steps to address the issue. These include fortifying its southern border with Guatemala. However, it's unclear if these steps will be enough to deter people from risking everything to seek opportunities in the U.S. Lionel Donovan, TRT World, Tijuana, Mexico. Well, I'm pleased to say we can speak now to the UNHCR's spokesperson, Baba Baloch, who joins us from Geneva. Uh, Baba, thank you very much for your time. Let's start with language. Animals, rapists, drug dealers, criminals. Just four ways that the US President Donald Trump has described migrants coming into the United States from Mexico. How significant are the words? How significant is the language that President Trump uses? So it really worries us uh, in terms of how refugees, asylum seekers are described in general uh, today. Uh, and let's not forget the notion that every refugee is trying to reach a rich country is not correct. As human beings, we want to be close to our home so you could return back uh, as soon as possible. 84% of world's 26 million refugees are in the underdeveloped, poor countries. These are communities who are poor but have big hearts. If a solution is going to be found, it needs to satisfy, of course, both sides. In other words, it needs to satisfy the refugee and it needs to satisfy the host nation. But how important is it that a solution is found? In other words, if we look ahead to the next few years, is this migration issue going to continue? Is the number going to continue? Or indeed, will it even grow in the next few decades? If the world is really serious, they should step forward to solve situations uh, like Syria, where millions have been forced out of their homes inside the country and outside the country at, uh, as refugees. 6.7 million Syrians are refugees. The uh, fifth uh, consecutive uh, year, the Turkey is the largest host, around 4 million, and other countries like Pakistan, uh, Uganda, and others. Then 
when desperate people arrive at the borders to trying to seek safety, a tradition which has been going on for centuries, if not for thousands of years, how can we turn back one desperate family with young children, with women, with elderly, with young people who are running away from war, for, from life threats? Baba, you're talking there about a humanitarian imperative. The problem is for host nations, there is a political imperative, there's a cultural imperative, there's an economic one as well. We know full well the reasons that people in host nations and the governments of those nations say they can't take any more people. They say they have no space, they say they don't have enough jobs, they say that the new arrivals culture is different, that their religion is different. Are you saying that the humanitarian imperative has to override every single practical imperative? After all, we are all human beings. Uh, don't look at these people as sheer numbers. These are desperate human beings. And that has been a humanities tradition which has been holding since centuries and centuries. How today oh, we can say we can't give sanctuary to people because the language is different, comes from a different background, and, and, and has a different religion. That is not the way the world has been, and it shouldn't change at all. But let's have a look at the numbers also. Who are these people? Where are they going? When you look at the rich countries and the poor developing and underdeveloped countries, you see that more than 80% of these desperate people are being hosted there. So what are we asking for? Understanding, solidarity, and compassion. Help refugees in the neighboring countries so they don't need uh, to run further afield. But also uh, share responsibility. Uh, majority of those countries that are hosting refugees, they, they are under pressure because that responsibility is not being shared by the rest of the world. The world is at a crossroads. Political dialogue is full of hate. Fear of the other is growing. The gap between rich and poor has never been greater. Millions of refugees can't plan for the future. They don't know when they may be forced to leave their host country. Life can be difficult, even for people who have lived in their new homes for years. Four decades ago, Vietnamese immigrants arrived in the UK, having escaped a conflict that killed almost two million civilians. Huen's customers say her pho is the best in London. She sticks to the original recipe she was taught as a girl in northern Vietnam. It's the most popular dish in her restaurant and reflects the delicate balancing act of fitting into British life while holding on to her old traditions. Yeah. Huen arrived in the UK in 1979, but her memories of the Vietnam War are still vivid. I remember, oh, we have to uh, move into the village, and then I just go to school, sitting on the floor. Very hard time. Just like many Syrians and other refugees who've recently entered Europe, Huen and her sister escaped Vietnam by boat. They risked drowning and pirates as they travelled to Hong Kong, a journey that lasted one week. I don't know how to swim, and we just see all around the sea. And then one time, you know, they got really um, windy. And then the boat would go like that, and then we so scared. The Vietnam War began in 1955 and lasted 20 years. Huen was one of tens of thousands of Vietnamese who escaped. <laughs> Bowing to international pressure, the British government took in some of those who'd arrived in Hong Kong, which was at the time a British colony. Huen now lives in the London district of Hackney, an area that's home to a large Vietnamese community. But when the refugees first arrived, they were dispersed across the country. It was part of a government policy aimed at preventing ghettoisation, but it resulted in isolating many Vietnamese who were left without access to vital resources, such as language classes. The policy is still in place, and it now affects Syrians and other migrants and refugees. Forty years on, the Vietnamese are now British citizens, but they remain one of the most underprivileged groups in the country. Experts say it's due to a lack of long-term planning in areas such as health. 
if you're a victim of torture, you were fleeing war and you're traumatised by that experience, which lots of Vietnamese people were, and we're finding people from Eritrea and Sudan and others are here today, is you can't tackle your mental health properly. If you haven't got good mental health, you're not going to school, you're not going to college, you're not learning English. If you're not learning English, you don't get a job. So it's a vicious cycle that we really need to break here. The Vietnam Huen now visits is very different from the country she left behind. She says she still feels Vietnamese but doesn't want to go back for good. And just as she overcame the obstacles she faced in the country of her birth, she says she'll continue to rise up to the many challenges she still faces in Britain, the country she now calls home. Shamim Chaudhry, TRT World, Hackney, London. Turkey is still host to the largest number of refugees, with almost four million. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has often spoken of a duty. It's an obligation to provide safety. It's a promise to help improve lives. And many have found hope in Turkey. There's an aid group called ASAM, the Association for Solidarity with Asylum Seekers and Migrants. It offers refugees the chance to go to school and later find work. Benim ismim Ala, 29 yaşındayım. Türkiye'ye 2015 yılında geldim. Erkek kardeşimle geldik. Dil bilmediğim için insanlarla iletişim kuramıyordum. Bir yere gitmek istediğimde gidemiyordum. Gitmek istiyorsam, taksi binmek istiyorsam tarif edemiyordum. Şimdi de tercümanlık yapıyorum. Ben burada nişanlandım ve benim nişanım burada yaşıyor. Burada da çalışıyor, benim işim de burada. Benim ailem Suriye'de kalıyor, Halep'te. Şimdi burada bir hayat kurduğum için burada kalmak istiyorum. Ama başka bir yere de gidebilirim bir fırsat bulursam, daha güzel bir fırsat bulursam. Ya da Suriye'ye dönebilirim bir Suriye'nin durumu düzelirse. The challenge of dealing with migrants and refugees demands something from all of us. It's a moral, political and humanitarian issue. It also includes considerations of race and culture, who we are and what we owe, what we stand for and our place in the world. But ultimately, it may be about one thing alone, responsibility. On World Refugee Day, we're going to leave you with this piece by the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darvish. Earth is pressing against us, trapping us in the final passage. To pass through, we pull off our limbs. Earth is squeezing us. If only we were its wheat, we might die and yet live. If only it were our mother, so that she might temper us with mercy. If only we were pictures of rocks held in our dreams like mirrors. We glimpse faces in their final battle for the soul, of those who will be killed by the last living among us. We mourn their children's feast. We saw the faces of those who would throw our children out of the windows of this last space. A star to burnish our mirrors. Where should we go after the last border? Where should birds fly after the last sky? Where should plants sleep after the last breath of air? We write our names with crimson mist. We end the hymn with our flesh. Here we will die, here in the final passage. Here or there, our blood will plant olive trees. <laughs>